Thank you for joining us to learn more about protecting our children from the almost constant RF radiation that is being emitted in today's technology-dense classrooms. My name is Patty Wood. I'm the founder and executive director of Grassroots Environmental Education. We're an environmental health nonprofit that created the Tech Safe Schools. Our work over the past several decades has been focused on protecting the most vulnerable in our society from common environmental exposures. One of our earlier programs, the Child Safe School, looked at chronic low-level exposures to chemicals found in school environments, including pesticides, diesel exhaust, petrochemical cleaners, synthetic turf, and wireless radiation. Because of the rapid growth of technology-based learning utilizing wireless technology and the coinciding growing body of research showing the potential for both acute and chronic harm to our children, as well as teachers and school staff, we were compelled to address RF radiation in schools as an urgent matter. We have been very fortunate to collaborate with a team of distinguished attorneys on issues of liability, a highly regarded building biologist on the technical aspects of dealing with both wireless and wired connections to the internet, and today's panel of experts on the science of RF radiation. So that we can have ample time for questions, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Paul Haru. Dr. Paul Haru is a scientist with extensive experience in physics, engineering, and the health sciences. He is an associate professor at McGill University, where he is the current director of the Occupational Health Program. Dr. Haru also serves as a medical scientist in the Department of Surgery at the McGill University Health Center. Dr. Haru? Thank you very much. The Federal Communications Commission does not protect our children from electromagnetic radiation. To understand why you should rise to change the present situation, you have to understand history. And so let's go into it a little bit. The first item I want to show you is from the year of your independence in 1776. That's when the problem started, so to speak. And uh, as you know, Adam Smith is the high priest of capitalism. And he believed that uh, markets were best managed by industry itself. But he also warned us about widening the market. And he was very suspicious of the motives of merchants in very many ways. So essentially, Smith warned us about letting the merchants make the rules because they would make the rules to their own advantage. So apparently, this warning, which is very, very old, was entirely forgotten. And the consequences of this have been many. For example, in 1923, we decided to include lead in gasoline instead of ethanol. And this is to the benefit, of course, of um, General Motors Corporation. And of course, a number of children lost permanently IQ points as a result of this exposure. Now, we were awakened as well to air pollution uh, by an event specifically in 1952, where 14,000 died in a few days. And we realized suddenly that air pollution was out of control. What this means is that society is not always very astute when it comes to managing these problems. War critically depends on radar and radio communications for its success. So this had a lot of impact. So in 1914, uh, there was this way of sending messages across a battlefield. And of course, uh, this was improved immensely during the war in that you could now use radios. We got rid of the bicycle and we now have modern uh, ways essentially to send messages. So of course, this was incredibly important to the military, which is why in 1953, when the risks were evaluated, the military were a big ingredient in the equation. At the US Navy conference in 53, Commander Brody remarked that people are always getting hurt in the service. So the fact that there might be effects of electromagnetic radiation, especially chronic ones, is not of great interest to us. At the bottom, I, I state, after all, no one loses wars because of cancer or sterility. So as far as the official record was concerned, no one had, had, had died as a result of exposure to RF radiation. And the Department of Defense cannot afford a program that would avert all risks. Where does this put us? In 1966, a standard was struck 
crystallized by a committee made up 15 people. 10 were from the armed service, one from the Petroleum Institute, one from Space Administration, one from General Dynamics, one from the US Treasury, and one from the US Public Health Service. So essentially, it was set in the interests and in a context of military conflict. So are exposures appropriate for a fighter pilot in his F-16 acceptable for your daughter in school? This is essentially what the military need as a means of telecommunications in a battlefield. And of course, the more telecommunications you can, uh, you can implement from the point of view of the military, absolutely the better. But does this relate to children in school? And my view is that it does not at all. So what do we know about the health impacts of the electromagnetic radiation that we have lived through until now? Well, what happened is that the military passed a baton to industry. And this baton was the thermal limit. It was determined that there was no problem with electromagnetic radiation but for the military unless thermal limits, in other words, heating of tissue was reached. This is a very convenient limit because it essentially legalizes astronomical levels of electromagnetic radiation in the environment. And industry could not resist passing this concept along. So this concept went from the military to the American National Standards Institute, to the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, to the Federal Communications Commission, unchanged until this day. And we see what has happened in our society in the meanwhile. We went from 1G to 2G to 3G to 4G and to 5G and the Internet of Things. And the transition to digital, while maintaining a heat criterion for protection, uh, essentially this criterion was maintained. So this is inappropriate. So what happened over time is that at the beginning, it was the military here that were exposed. And in uh, present day environments, everyone is exposed. And we can see here with these successive curves that display frequency versus intensity with a very condensed log scale that exposures are, ex are really very rapidly increasing to the point where, as you can see here in these little bumps, at the, the telecommunications limit, we are approaching at the telecommunications frequencies, we're approaching the thermal limits. So our environment has changed drastically as well as the number of people exposed, which essentially today means everyone. So what evidence do we have that our health is affected by this radiation? Well, taking sing simply the one issue of cancer, we have truly crushing evidence that this agent, electromagnetic radiation, as used in telecommunications, is a cancer-causing agent. So essentially, we have lim studies by Chu, Repacholi, Lurchel, NTP, and Ramazzini. I will talk a little bit, very briefly, about each one of them. But together, they uh, involve 4,288 rats and 2,180 mice. And I am often, often told by uh, legislators that, well, Dr. Eru, you are very biased because you are a specialist, a specialist of this question. But I like to point out that these rats and these mice are very difficult to bias individually in conversation. They develop tumors while their friends who were not exposed to radiation did not. So this evidence is very difficult to disable. In Chu, a near fourfold increase in primary malignancies in the exposed. Note that this study had no practical impact in the sense that it was swept under the, uh, the carpet. In 1997, Repacholi used a bunch of, uh, essentially, of animals who were predisposed to having leukemia. 
And in spite of the fact that he spontaneously had a lot of leukemia, he was able to double the amount of leukemia in these animals. And then we have the recently released National Toxicology Program studies that show what is called here, clear evidence of carcinogenicity. You cannot be any clearer than that. So why aren't our officials and leaders listening? This was not a small study. It lasted 10 years, cost more than $25 million, and was very seriously done. Why didn't, have, didn't it have any more consequences? This is the Ramazzini study. While the NPP study referred to the use of a cell phone, the Ramazzini study investigated what happens when you're near a cellular base station. In other words, when you're in the neighborhood of these base stations that provide the signal to your phone. And again, they confirmed in a spectacular way that it, this agent is carcinogenic. So we also have evidence from epidemiology from two uh, thick reports by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, both on low frequencies and on radio frequencies, and they have both been linked to increases in certain types of cancers. So I want to finish the issue of cancer by uh, quoting uh, my colleague Anthony Miller of the University of Toronto. He is very, very worried about what is happening to American children for ages zero to four between 2000 and 2010, there was an increase annually of 0.6% per year in cancers. In ages 15 to 19, between 2000 and 2008, it increased annually by 1% per year. So we have indications that our environment is affecting the rate of disease. So we know that the International Agency for Research on Cancer will soon reassess electromagnetic radiation, which is currently a 2B level, perhaps to become a class one carcinogen. So are you willing to deploy a class one carcinogen in your community? Class one means it's a confirmed human carcinogen. Now the federal communication safety limits, they have arguments to support these high limits. Telecom sig signals use non-ionizing frequencies. And they say that the fields are too weak. They are subthermal. They don't heat anything. But this is entirely nonsensical because it draws attention to things that are unimportant. We have to understand that the body is already ionized. And I quote here Dr. Gary Woods, who sat with me on the New Hampshire Commission. He says, it makes no sense to refer to ionization when you want to assess the impact on already ionized chemicals in the body. Small fields or viruses obviously cannot harm you. Really? We've got direct experience that this isn't true. It's not about the energy of molecules in the thermal soup. It's about electrons and protons. So essentially, the safety lim limits of the FCC are looking in the wrong direction. Wi-Fi in schools, library, and our homes. Where do our children go to be safe? Well, there is an intention by the sellers, by Village Telco, as an example here, to put as many of these connections, wireless connections, in the classroom as possible. Typically, 30 in a classroom situation. But you have many instances in which you can equip classrooms for uh, stations to connect with one another. So essentially, you could have a lot more communications than 30 going on at the same time. This means that essentially, these classrooms could, could attain and reach the FCC limits. But as far as industry does not reach them, they are allowed to commercialize equipment. So let's look, look at recent results on the effects of microwave radiation on the brain. And this is a report by the military uh, medical research branch of the Chinese military. And of course, they are worried about the effects of radiation on their child, uh, uh, soldiers. Then, of course, they don't have any young children in their army uh, who have developing brains. So, but they 
state that the brain has been recognized as one of the organs that is most vulnerable to microwave radiation. And where? In the hippocampus, the seat of memory. So this is a very troubling result. We have continuous exposures to uh, GSM radiation that changes the morphology of neural cells in culture. In other words, you are going to change the anatomy of the brain. And especially if it is developing, these changes in the brain could be permanent. Exposure to cell phone radiation upregulates apoptosis in primary cultures of neurons and astrocytes. Well, apoptosis is another name for the death of cells. So what this means is that these exposures, although they were a little bit high, they were also relatively brief, could kill neural cells. They can kill cells in the brain. So this is another troubling report. And then the relationship between cognition function and hippocampus in long-term microwave exposure. And here we'll, we're dealing, of course, with rats. And we can see that if we expose them at levels below what is legal in the United States, you have effects on their mental processes, on their cognition, and on hippocampus structure. And you know that uh, industry is very keen about penetrating schools because it creates a lifelong habit. And this habit of uh, wireless use would be prolonged in college students. Well, college students who are dependent on mobile cell phones have altered gray matter volume. So what this means is that chronic exposure to this radiation has dire consequences on our children and our students. So essentially, what we need to do, uh, this is the end of the presentation, you need to get up and recognize what your environment is becoming and reflecting on whether you want this to continue or whether something should be done about it. If nothing is done about it, well, uh, Smith's prediction about uh, the, uh, the commerce taking over everything to the detriment of our health and our children will come true. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that great presentation. To be sure we have adequate time for questions and to hear more from Dr. Haru in a few minutes, I want to move on right away with my introduction of our next panelist, Dr. Deborah Davis. Dr. Davis founded the Environmental Health Trust in 2007 to provide basic research and education about environmental health hazards and to promote constructive governmental policies locally, nationally, and internationally. Currently visiting professor of medicine at the Hebrew University Hadassah Medical School in Jerusalem, Dr. Davis lectures at UC San Francisco and Berkeley, Dartmouth, Georgetown, Harvard, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and other major universities throughout the world. Dr. Davis has also authored more than 200 publications in books and journals, ranging from the Lancet and Journal of the American Medical Association to Scientific American and the New York Times. She is the author of three award-winning books, including her latest book, Disconnect, The Truth About Cell Phone Radiation, What the Industry is Doing to Hide It, and How to Protect Your Family. And now I'd like to introduce Devra. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And I'd like to share my uh, slides with you. Um, I'm going to talk today about the evidence on wireless radiation and the growing amount of wireless radiation and how this is affecting our children, uh, particularly because as Dr. Eru just indicated, uh, there's growing exposures and there's no consideration being made whatsoever to the need to test and evaluate the fact that children are not just little adults. There's a large body of science showing that wireless radiation can cause harm at the current levels permitted. And I would add that Israel and India are two high tech countries that currently have limits on their tower radiation that is one tenth of that allowed by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation. And that level is actually too high according to studies that uh, Professor Eru just showed you. And so these are some of the studies that have demonstrated that there are clearly evidence for effects that occur without heat. These are studies that have been done by uh, Dominique Belpalm and David Carpenter. I've participated in a number of studies with Anthony Miller, including one which concluded that in 2019, if one were to look 
at all of the evidence at that time, including experimental evidence and human evidence, you would conclude that wireless radiation is a human carcinogen. Now, I wanna stress something about animal studies since uh, Professor Haru took some time to show you some of those data. Every compound that we know for sure produces cancer in people because we have sick or dead people with evidence of exposure and cancer. Every single compound that causes cancer in people produces it in animals when adequately studied. And that is why we have to pay attention to what the animals are trying to tell us. We have data that I'm gonna show you on exposure modeling. We have experimental studies that look either at whole animals or cell cultures. And then finally, we have epidemiologic studies in people. It's always been very difficult to get animals to make cell phone calls. It's always been very difficult to get animals to behave as humans do. But we have data from the National Toxicology Program that clearly shows, according to multiple peer reviews, that there is clear evidence of cancer, of highly malignant cancers of the brain uh, and of the nerve in the heart that are very rare, but very malignant. And that is enough reason for concern but I'm going to tell you there are many other health effects in children particularly that we have to pay attention to. But first, let me show you something about exposure. Here's what we know. Children are more vulnerable to wireless radiation. Their skulls are thinner, their heads are smaller, and they have more fluid within the brain. And because of that, studies that have been done experimentally, some of which I'm going to show you, clearly show that some of the most important parts of the brain, the hippocampus you heard about just before, can be affected by and are exposed greatly to wireless radiation. And they absorb more wireless radiation than a big, large adult, who, by the way, came from the 97th percentile of military recruits uh, from the US Army. And we know that there are exposures that take place for children to the brain, the eyes, the endocrine and reproductive systems, and those exposures are really important. Now the FCC standards, um, if you can call them standards, were actually set 25 years ago. That's when the FCC standards were set. And um, you, I wanna show you here, this guy with his big brain. This man was the model for this, basically had about a 12 pound head. Think about that when you look at your children, right? So here we have the sample SAM, we call him standard, anthropomorphic mannequin. And Sam was made to measure phone calls with a spacer between his brain and the, and the phone. But it, Sam is also used to measure wireless exposures from iPads and other devices. They use his, his body, seen here at the bottom of my screen, there's a, uh, supposedly, and you'll see it's all flat body with a liquid poured into it. And that is what we do to estimate exposures. We know that those estimations are not relevant to today's experience. Just look at this one. This is modeling that I've done with my colleagues in Brazil, where we've looked at one millimeter cubes that you can model in a three-dimensional space. And you can see here that a child who's holding a tablet just about six inches from his body, which his arms don't even reach much longer, that child will absorb the most radiation into the part of the brain that is still developing. Think about that. This radiation from this tablet is the same frequency that the microwave oven uses. The microwave oven operates at a thousand watts of power. The tablet operates at less than one, ideally, but, but it's not the power of the radiation that we have to worry about. It's the pulse. It's the repeated pattern that's sending the information. It's the information content on the frequency, not just the frequency itself. So the old approach to look just at the frequencies is clearly inappropriate. This is a slide that just compares the absorption. If you look carefully into the child, you'll see that the yellow and white is much higher. There's much more absorption that gets into the child. It's almost halfway through their head. And again, with their thinner skulls and their smaller heads, there's much greater absorption. More information on this and the work done by Claudio Fernandez with Environmental Health Trust can be found on, on our website at ehtrust.org. This is another simulation that we did with Claudio Fernandez. And this again is the so laptop. Now, you know, they're not marketed as laptops anymore. 
They're called tablets. They belong on tables. But you see, if you look carefully at this radiation, it, it gets really into the central area, the abdominal area, because there is no thick skull to protect it. And we actually, with, with Tony Miller, we have just published a paper showing that the rate of colorectal cancer in people in their 20s and 30s has quadrupled in the past decade in the United States, Iran, uh, Brazil, and the UK. Nobody knows why. And it's a very rare cancer in these young people, but the fact is it's increasing radically. And I believe that have this habit of keeping these devices on the body, which our children will do in the classroom, is contributing to the problem. And of course, having a, a device close to the a rectum in the back is a problem as well. I just wanna share with you the idea that we have to understand that you get direct exposure as when the child holds this, lap, this iPad right over her reproductive organs. Um, you get secondhand exposure as when these children are sitting very close to their dad. And what most people don't know is that where the antennas are located and different devices have antennas in different positions. So you need to know that in order to make a decision about how you can reduce your exposures. And then finally, we have a third hand exposure from these towers, which in Israel and France and Belgium it is against the law to put a cell tower on or near a school or a playground. It's against the law. We, we somehow, we missed that memo in a big way. And as Professor Heroux indicated, we missed it in part because the lobbying efforts of this industry are incredible. And that is why I'm so grateful to grassroots environmental education for what they are doing in launching this project, because I know many people are unaware, unaware of the fact that exposures can take place firsthand, just like with cigarette smoke, secondhand, and as well, a third hand. Now, a number of studies have been published recently, and they all show an increase in oxidative stress. Well, what is that exactly? Free radicals are produced and they are like cougars in the body. They go and find things that are weak and kill them, attack them, or cause them to grow cancer. And so what we see is in nine, by 2015, uh, Yakomenko did a review of the literature and he found the great majority of studies showed an increase in this oxidative stress, which is a precursor to damage to the nervous system, to starting cancer to grow, et cetera. Most recently, a very distinguished expert group advised the Swiss government that the majority of animal and cell culture studies show evidence of oxidative stress and that therefore they warn that the very young, the old and those with pre-existing conditions are at considerable risk. Now, the work that Professor Eru showed you has increasingly confirmed the understanding that wireless radiation causes cancer. In 2011, the International Agency for Research on Cancer classified this as a possible carcinogen. Additional determinations have been made by some of the resources here. And I call your attention to our new publication published just before the end of the year with Anthony Miller on the increase in rectal cancer in young adults. Um, because it's a puzzling increase. It's a tragic increase because it's often detected late. Now, wireless radiation clearly affects the brain. And this is a very important research that was done by my colleague, Suleiman Kaplan uh, at uh, Ana Kuzmeyuz University in Turkey, where control animals were not exposed. Exposed animals received exposure to a typical small amount of radiation that you might get from using devices. And what they showed, if you see at the controls at the top, there's a bunch of very nice uniform cells. They all have borders. Cells are supposed to have borders. At the bottom, you can see that the cell borders are gone. And so this is evidence that prenatal exposure can damage the brain in these animals. And remember, we are not rats and mice, but we share most of their genes. And so we're seeing here damage to brain cells, fewer brain cells and cells with more damage. And other studies show that children who are exposed when their mothers are pregnant and early in life also have more hyperactivity and problems with um, attention. Experimental studies, again, I'm not gonna go through them in, in great detail because I think they've been covered, except to point out that not only are these studies relevant to cancer, 
but they're relevant to sperm formation and performance. Uh, so we are seeing evidence of, of the expressions of messenger RNA being affected in a, a negative way. And we're seeing that the DNA of the brain and, and of other organs in these animals that are exposed is profoundly affected. But thinking about children in classrooms where they are constantly being encouraged to use devices and there's not an awareness there's not an awareness that you're exposing children to something that we know causes cancer in animals and we believe causes cancer in people because we have data. And yet we are this, it seems that there's a disconnect between what we know in science and what we're doing to our children right now. If you take human male sperm under controlled conditions and put them under a laptop with no heat being generated, no heat at all, Within four hours, you can look at those sperm and see markers of damage into how well they swim and how their DNA is shaped. And this in turn influences their capacity to fertilize. And therefore you see on the left, that huge black bar that is showing you evidence of sperm fragmentation in the exposed animals compared to the unexposed. I encourage you to be aware that there are many schools around the world that have taken steps to reduce exposure. Um, and in China, uh, Huawei has made a baby safe router that goes to sleep. It's not on all the time. And there are many options to make technology safer through changes in hardware and software, but we have to be more insistent that we demand those kinds of products. This is an example of steps that have been taken in Cyprus where our, our colleague, have worked with the hospital there and the neonatal intensive care unit and the pediatric wing do not have wireless. They've replaced it with ethernet. So there are cables like this one that I use that are connected to ethernet. It makes it faster, it's safer, it's more secure. These are some of the policies that other countries have adopted. Uh, in France and China, children are not allowed to have cell phones um, and many other countries are following suit often because of concerns about bullying, but in France, for example, they have issued a warning that teenagers should avoid exposing their abdomens to cell phone or other radiation. That's an official French government recommendation. In Israel, they have limited Wi-Fi in nurseries and, and minimized it in elementary schools. And India and many countries have mandatory labeling about the amount of radiation coming out of phones. So this experiment on our children should come to an end. And we need to make sure people are aware that you can use technology safely and more safely and more smart than we are doing now. And with that, we will be able to protect our children. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Devra. Clearly there is a lot of material to cover and you have given us a lot to think about. I would now like to introduce our last panelist, Dr. Toral Jelter. After Dr. Jelter speaks, we will open up the chat for your questions. Dr. Toral Jelter is a general practitioner and pediatrician with over 30 years of experience. She studied medicine at the University of Oslo, graduating with honors. She completed her residency in pediatrics at Columbia School of Physicians and Surgeons and later practiced at the Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital and St. Peter's Hospital and has worked in a wide range of clinical settings. Dr. Jelter is a member of the American Academy of Pediatrics, the Collaborative on Health and the Environment, and the Physicians Health Initiative on Radiation and the Environment. Dr. Jelter. So I'm going to talk about uh, how children are affected by wireless radiation. And uh, so uh, the first case that I had where I, I, I had a four-year-old boy with uh, sleep difficulties come to my office and his parents said that he had basically been in their bed for the last two years. Um, and he wasn't, it wasn't just a matter of him not being able to go to sleep at night, but he um, was uh, very hyper up, um, wanted to walk around, wanted to eat, play games. And uh, I reviewed the typical sleep hygiene questions that a pediatrician asks, you know, do you have a regular bedtime? Are you drinking caffeinated drinks before you go to bed on and on? And um, they were doing all the usual good things. And um, then I um, 
they mentioned that they had tried some melatonin the evening before they came to see me and he seemed to sleep a little bit better that night and I had just read an article about how wireless radiation can disturb melatonin metabolism and so I asked them about the exposure uh, in the home and it was quite considerable and suggested that they turn off the Wi-Fi router for 12 hours at night, uh, unplug all cordless phones and turn off the cell phones. And um, they agreed that they would like to try this before trying um, other medications or continuing the melatonin. And within uh, a week, he was sleeping in his own bed, no problem, going to bed at a regular time. And uh, the parents were very pleased about this result. Another case I had was a nine-year-old boy with headaches and anxiety. Uh, he was going to a parochial school in a large city nearby. Uh, the school had uh, very many uh, devices, smart boards, and you name it. The boy told me that he couldn't think straight inside the school, but he said, I can on the football field. Uh, he could also say that it had started on the third day of school when he was sitting in the chapel. Uh, and he was nervous and so were the parents that he had a brain tumor because the headaches were so severe. So I suggested that um, when I spoke to them on the phone, I just said, well, why don't you just turn the Wi-Fi router off, you know, tonight and I'll see him tomorrow. And I did a neurological exam. I didn't find any abnormalities on the neurological exam, fortunately. Um, and then they um, agreed to do the low, no EMF um, protocol that I mentioned. And lo and behold, his symptoms subsided substantially in the home, but he continued to have problems at school. Uh, the reason I um, asked uh, parents to turn the Wi-Fi router off for 12 hours at night and not 24 seven initially is because I'm more likely to get the fathers on board with that. Uh, in this case, the father actually, well, had a problem doing the things that I recommended because he was very engaged with the tech industry. I think his employment was in the tech industry. And he said that he preferred to send the child to a psychologist. And um, so he was lost to follow up and uh, I am concerned about what happened to him eventually. So the symptoms vary significantly with time and location. If that happens, you've got to start thinking about environmental factors. Uh, another boy, the parents had discovered that he had a lot of symptoms and, and particularly a rash that uh, came and went. Um, they had figured out that uh, a number of this other symptoms he had decreased when they eliminated wireless radiation in the home but uh, he continued to have rashes when he went to school for long periods of time that decreased on the weekends and disappeared on longer vacations and during the summer. Um, uh, they um, did a lot to try and get the school to uh, accommodate him um, with very limited success. Uh, Dr. Oler Johansson has found that you can find uh, abnormalities in skin biopsies in cases like this. Um, an eight-year-old boy with insomnia and learning difficulties, we uh, started with trying to figure out how we were going to get him to sleep better at night because we all know that if a child has a good quality and good duration of sleep at night, it's much easier for them to learn. So um, they agreed to unplug the Wi-Fi router 12 hours at night, unplug the cordless phones, turn off the cell phones. And um, his sleep problems uh, improved substantially. And an interesting thing that happened was that they contacted me in June and uh, they continued to do low EMF in the home um, through the summer. And when he went back to school in September, uh, the parents were called into the school for a meeting with school staff. They said there were like 10 people there, principal, you name it, um, the, the aides that had been helping him with his learning difficulties. And they all wanted to know what the parents, what they had changed, what he was doing. They really wanted to know what medication they had put him on. And when they explained that they had lowered the Wi-Fi in the home, um, the school staff were just shocked and uh, couldn't, had never heard of such a thing before.
um, and they said that he had actually improved two grade levels in two months. Uh, this case here, um, a 10 year old boy with nonverbal autism and aggression um, that came to me primarily because of the aggression. Um, they were considering putting him on various medications and I reviewed the uh, wireless radiation that he was exposed to in the home with them and found that it was substantial. It was, and they, the other thing about this case was that they lived on a military base. And so I thought if wireless radiation was contributing to his problems, maybe going low EMF in the home wouldn't help. Uh, since there was so there would be radar and so many other things outside the home, but we still decided they agreed to do a one to two week trial, and um, this child actually said a full sentence within three days. He said, "Mom, pass me the scissors." Mom's jaw dropped. His jaw dropped. Nobody had he had never she'd never heard him say a word before. He had uh, never had been able to say anything that anybody would understand. Um, his aggressive behavior uh, actually went away. They had thought that they would have to institutionalize him. Uh, he was not institutionalized before he would take a lamp and throw it against the wall. Um, mom was very petite, so she was concerned, you know, that she couldn't have him at home much longer. Uh, the other thing that happened in this case was that um, mother had a seizure disorder and the frequency and severity of her seizure disorder improved dramatically with the things they did in their home. Uh, this is a, a teen with electrohypersensitivity. Um, her name is Jenny Fry. Um, and uh, the photographs are not actual photographs. Um, they are stock images. Um, but uh, so she's a 15 year old attending school in the UK and she tried repeatedly to get accommodations at school because she got sick from um, wireless exposure. They had figured this out because mom had similar problems. So they had lowered the exposure in their home and um, both mom and the daughter were, felt better at home, um, but they were unable to get accommodations in the school. When you have this problem, as you can understand, uh, they also call it the loner sickness because it becomes very difficult to socialize. And unfortunately, eventually this child uh, at 15 committed suicide. Uh, the wireless radiation is not affecting just the children in schools. It's also affecting the teachers. I get teachers coming to me um, with a wide array of uh, problems. Remember radiation doesn't just affect one cell or one organ in the body. It can has the potential to affect every cell, every organ in the body. This teacher noticed that she could think clearly before she went into the classroom. When she got into the classroom, she would get brain fog. She couldn't think clearly. She, uh, when she, after she came to me, uh, we realized that she actually was standing right underneath a Wi-Fi router. She also had a metal hairpiece in her hair. I have patients that have noticed that if they have metal in or on their body, that seems to ex uh, accentuate the harmful effects of the EMF radiation, wireless radiation they're exposed to. She was and is a phenomenal teacher, would love to work, but she cannot no longer find a classroom that she can work in anymore. So electro hypersensitivity, um, here's a lengthy uh, uh, definition um, by Dr. Erica Mallory Blythe, pediatrician in the UK. It's a multi-system medical condition characterized by physical symptoms associated with anthropogenic electromagnetic field exposure. And similar constellation of symptoms may also be seen in the general population when exposures to RF are higher. It's a proven to be a physical response under blinded conditions and biomarkers are being identified and mechanisms to explain the reaction are evolving. Guidelines for EHS diagnosis and management have been peer reviewed and published, which makes it clear that the mainstay of medical management is avoidance of um, wireless radiation and other EMFs. Disability and compensation cases for those with EHS are already being won and will continue to escalate. So what are the symptoms of electrohypersensitivity? Well, if radiation can affect every cell in the body, there are a lot of different symptoms. 
Um, you can have anxiety, chest tightness, depression, restlessness, hyperactivity, irritability or fatigue, noise sensitivity, concentration difficulties, headaches we've mentioned, dizziness, a ringing in the ears, um, sleep problems, ringing in the ears. Some people have ringing in the ears that's so bad that they almost don't want to live anymore. Then they go to a rural area and um, uh, some people within 24 hours notice that it's dramatically improved. Other people, it can take 10 days, then they come back to uh, the Bay Area and uh, within 24 hours, the ring in the ears is back. Um, and it, another symptom is anomia, difficulty finding words, burning sensation, urinary urgency, heart palpitations. Dr. Magda Havas has a wonderful YouTube showing how you bring a device close to a person that's uh, EMF sensitive and you can see the heart rhythm change. There are blood pressure problems. You can have an increase in blood pressure, hypertension or hypotension, depending on what kind of uh, vulnerability the individual has and what kind of uh, wireless radiation the person's being exposed to. So electrohypersensitivity is a clinical diagnosis. The patient's story is critical. It's very important to listen to them. You try to identify situations that are retrospectively single blinded or double blinded. For example, the eight year old boy I was talking about that had uh, sleep problems and um, learning difficulties. Um, in October of uh, that year, um, he, uh, after doing very well at school and being able to sleep, he, he re regressed and started having learning difficulties again and wasn't able to sleep at night. The parents, uh, mom was wondering, could it be because it's around Halloween, he's eaten a lot of candy and she just couldn't understand because she didn't think anything had changed in his EMF environment, um, at least not in the home. And then they discovered that the older sister had turned the Wi-Fi router back on and mother didn't know and the child didn't know. So they turned it back off again and his learning difficulties subsided and he was able to sleep again. It's very important to conduct a comp comprehensive physical exam, um, uh, get an EMF assessment by a certified EMF consultant or building biologist and do a thorough differential diagnosis. In uh, the case of environmental factors, do the symptoms vary significantly with time and or locations? Or do the symptoms vary significantly with variations in exposure to wireless radiation? Uh, I had one mother come to me saying that her child had been diagnosed with a neurodevelopmental problem at the age of five. And she said, but I don't think it's true because when I take my uh, daughter, uh, the daughter was actually flapping very, very um, uh, dramatic uh, arm movements. Um, she said, when I take my daughter to my mother, to her grandmother in rural Tennessee, within a week, the flapping goes away. Um, and then uh, she's good. We stay three, four weeks. And then when we came back again to the Bay Area, um, the flapping started. Another uh, family told me about taking their son who had a neurodevelopmental disorder um, to rural Oregon from the San Francisco Bay Area. And in, here in the, the Bay Area, he had high pitched screaming, head banging, couldn't play with other children. He was four at that time. Uh, when they she went to her sister in rural Oregon, this child was then able to play with other children, the head banging went away, the high pitched screaming went away. When they drove back to the Bay Area and um, on the way around Sacramento, he would start with the high pitched screaming and head banging again. Unfortunately, this was a divorce situation. So um, the father wanted the child to stay and um, she was unable to move at that time. Biomarkers can be supportive of it a diagnosis of electrohypersensitivity, but it's not, they're not pathognomonic. The different biomarkers that um, can be used uh, are blood, urine, and showing inflammatory markers, increase in histamine, oxidative stress. You can find uh, autoimmune response antibodies to myelin, which is the lining of the brain, decreased availability of melatonin. Imaging um, ultrasound studies can show decreased blood flow to the thalamus and limbic system. Functional MRIs show abnormal brain perfusion. 
and abnormal skin biopsies can be found. The Im immune system is also dr can dramatically be shifted. So I'm not going to read all this, but um, suffice it to say that um, it would be unfortunate if we had a pandemic where the children are um, affected. Uh, and in international classification of diseases, the European Academy of Environmental Medicine recommends that currently in EMF related health problems that we use the code uh, for exposure to radiation Z58.4 and um, the existing codes for different diseases and symptoms and for electrohypersensitivity that we use the code for exposure to radiation also R68.8 other specified general symptoms and signs and existing codes for different um, symptoms until we get a specific code for electrohypersensitivity, which is in the works and there have been multiple requests to get that uh, going. So who is el else is concerned other than everybody who's here? The American Academy of Pediatrics is very concerned. This is the pro professional organization for pediatricians in the United States with over 60,000 members. And they have written multiple letters to the FCC asking them to reevaluate their uh, safety limits. The American Academy of Environmental F Physicians has recommended that, for example, smart meters not be placed on schools or homes. The California Department of Public Health has issued uh, safety guidelines for cell phones, but unfortunately, it took many years for these to come out, and it was actually uh, Dr. Joel Moskowitz at the UC Berkeley uh, School of Public Health that had to get that released, and it was a very arduous process. The Americans with Disability Act, ADA, recognizes electrohypersensitivity as a, a disability now that necessitating accommodations. The National Toxicology Program study has uh, been mentioned and IARC uh, now classifies wireless radiation as a class 2B carcinogen, but uh, it should probably be a, a one. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Jelter, for that um, for that really um, important information. I think it helps to know what some of these symptoms are. Our first question is, how do we find a doctor who knows about this issue? That's a really good question. And unfortunately, there are very few physicians currently that um, have much knowledge about this. But uh, here in the Bay Area, I refer people to the Physicians for Safe Technology, MD Safe Tech, um, and uh, they have an, a number of referrals. Um, the, yes, that would be my primary recommendation. Uh, I also, you know, work with primary care doctors and try and educate them. Some are open to this knowledge and some are not. And, um, I'm, I don't really take primary care patients any longer, but I, uh, all my adult patients have to have a primary care doctor. And then I try and educate my patients on how they can educate their doctors, doctor. And uh, yeah, so I will mute myself and maybe uh, Debra and uh, Paul have some more tips there. Yes, um, I think the American Academy of Environmental Medicine is on record as being quite concerned about this issue. And so that's another resource that people might be able to use. Um, but you're quite right, of course, Dr. Jeter. Um, there are not that many physicians, but I think that uh, Physicians for Safe Tech and Dr. Cindy Russell um, at uh, Stanford and Palo Alto can refer uh, people. And um, we, there, are, there is the psychiatrist um, who is uh, in your area as well, who, who works with children and has had remarkable success. Um, we, we were with her at the meeting and I'm sorry right now, her name escapes me. Um, Dr. Victoria Dunkley. Thank you. And she has an ex excellent book called uh, How to Reset Your Child's Brain. Thank you, Deborah. Yeah, and she tells stories very much like the ones you tell of remarkable changes in children. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking to see what's happening to these children when they are exposed and see the difference when they get out into an environment like the one that I can live in where there's not much more, not much exposure. And you see the change. And yet uh, some of these hipster parents, as you indicated, 
are just unwilling uh, to, to even consider it. And it's, it's actually not, not hard. I think we need to do a better job of explaining that uh, safer technology is actually faster and smarter. I mean, for example, you use less energy if you're using an, a wired ethernet connection than you do with the wireless router. That may sound trivial on a household level, but for a school, for a large school, that actually could affect its budget. And we need to start running the numbers and so showing people that there really are economic and public health consequences of the way we're using energy now. Yes, of course. Uh, I have many people in, uh, in Quebec and even in Canada who call me in relation to this question. And essentially, in terms of referral, it's very difficult here because the physicians who dare to tackle this question are often persecuted because there is action by people who are hired by telcos or by power uh, companies to intimidate them. So there is a, a, lo a long way to go uh, in order to develop expertise. And after all, when you are uh, curing um, an electrosensitive person, you're not selling any pills, you're just giving a uh, description of what they should do better. So there's a big difference. Thank well, you. I'd like to also bring your attention to Dr. Rena Bray, who has been med medical director of the Environmental Health Clinic at the Women's College Hospital uh, in Toronto. She has a very unusual background in because she's achieved first class honors in chemical engineering and then got a master's of science in pharmacology and then studied medicine in, in Toronto. And she is now one of the few people with a very active practice uh, unfortunately, with a long wait list, who deals with electromagnetic illness. And um, she has trained hundreds of medical students and others. And we're, uh, with Dr. Bray, I was able to write a chapter in a medical textbook in environmental medicine uh, in the series by Andrew Weil. And there's a chapter in that book by her and me and uh, others where we talk about some of the same things we've been discussing. Another question. If schools look to the World Health Organization for direction, the website says that the science on this is inconclusive. So what is happening at the World Health Organization between industry and independent scientists? And why should we wait for public policy to catch up with independent science? I think I can put a few words in on that. The WHO, in spite of its name, is a political organization. It, uh, of course, it manages, so to speak, the health of the planet, but it has a very good track record of making agreements with industry, in particular, the nuclear industry. In other words, they make arrangements with powerful people in society. And to their credit, they are not large enough to oppose them. So unfortunately, uh, although we don't like to think of the world that way, there's power struggles and there's large, I would say, influential bodies that don't necessarily make rational de uh, decisions in relation to the health of people. So the World Health Organization is just about to start tackling the problem of air pollution. I mean, in 1948, you had deaths in the United States, you know, from from air pollution that was very short term, that was very, very obvious to see. But it took 70 years for a WHO to tackle these problems. You can't take, you know, trust them to take care of your health. And neither can you trust, of course, the FCC, who is entirely manned by people from industry. Thank you. If the FCC E-rate program only promotes wireless solutions, what can a school do? There are some legal liabilities. And one of the first things that schools need to understand is that this industry is uninsurable. It's uninsurable. They cannot get insurance to cover health or environmental impacts from electromagnetic fields. I think that that should make the schools concerned. And further, um, <clears throat> I worked with the California Department of Health on the notice that finally got out, Dr. Jeter, uh, that notice was drafted after meetings that we held in 2009. And so it took a long time and only after Professor Moskowitz filed a lawsuit did we finally get the guidance released. And the guidance that was released is so much weaker than what they first recommended. 
and you can see all of this on our website, but just one example. In 2009, they were prepared to issue an advice to all people working for the state of California, which is a lot of people, not to have phones on their bodies and to use speaker phones and headsets and be aware of <clears throat> weak signals in 2009. And that advice a bit to the California working people for the government was deleted. Several people have asked this question. How is pulsed radiation different from other types of radiation and why is it more dangerous? Up, 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 up. And repeated pulsing actually can be damaging even at very, very low power. So it's not just the frequency we have to be concerned about. It's not just the power of the frequency we have to be concerned about. It is the pattern of repeated pulsation. And that has been shown to weaken membranes, to release these free radicals, oxidative stress, uh, to work in part through voltage gated calcium channels and other mechanisms that have been identified uh, that indicate that this repeated pulsation basically snaps the band eventually. I want to thank everyone today for joining us for this very important webinar and a special thanks to our guest speakers and panelists who have shared their expertise with us. If you have any further questions or would like more information, please don't hesitate to contact us at techsafeschools.org. Thank you again.